Welcome to Curtis Goes Corner Podcast. Straight talk, unfiltered commentary. No PC here. Sit back and listen to some common sense discussion. And as always, thank you for your support. Welcome to the first episode of Cordis Goes Corner Podcast. We're going to talk about, just talk about things that affect our lives here in the United States and around the world, locally, nationally, internationally. Today we're going to talk about three subjects. What's the Democrat strategy? I'm, I'm wondering myself, are the Republicans going to grow a spine? Or is, as they say in Spanish, a set of huevos? And Democratic unity and Republican unity. So let's talk about the Democrats' strategy first. This is going to be a formal show. It's just going to shoot the breeze. Uh, we're going to have guests on occasionally in the future, talk about certain subjects. But just for today, I, I'm wondering, what's the Democrats' end game? I'm a chess player. I used to organize chess tournaments. I still play in tournaments. And now you chess players know you play out your game, you play, play by the rules, which the Democrats don't. You play by the rules, and you get to an end game. And you try to win in the end game. That's normally how games go. I, for the life of me, can't figure out what's the Democrats' strategy. Now, I can see they harp on things like the, the Capitol riot. I can see them jumping on that and, you know, Rahm Emanuel, the former chief of staff to President Obama, former mayor of Chicago, said never let a good crisis go to waste. Okay, that's fine. A bunch of people acted really stupid, did some dumb things. Some people were hurt. One was killed. Okay. And they pound on it and pound on it and pound on it. Then they had their little bit of their little bit of their commission. And all right, I get it. You're Opposition, in this case, Trump slash Republican people, really, really screwed up. Very bad optics, very stupid, very dumb, and I agree it was stupid and dumb. All right, I can see them jumping all over it. And then they had the some of the Capitol Police officers there. Now, I have respect for police. I was endorsed by the local police department here in upstate New York. Every time I ran for city council, it was a council between 2000 and 2007 here upstate. I have great respect for law enforcement. But that was a show. That was It was acting. I mean, let, let's cut through it, shall we? Uh, and if it wasn't acting, then those police officers, their ideology has possessed them, and they've lost all sense of of reason and common sense. So I can see the Democrats really, really jumping on that issue. All right, okay. When your enemy makes a mistake, you pound on it. No problem, I get it. That's part of the strategy. But what the heck's the end game? What's the end game for these people? I don't get it. I mean, we'll start with the policy of the open borders. My God, my God, what's going on? 1.2 million people just just in a year over 7,000 COVID positive illegal migrants brought into McAllen, Texas, overwhelming them. Whereas the local sheriff and police department has to take the role of border patrol now, I'm not blaming the Border Patrol agents. They're just doing what they're told, like any good soldiers do. I get it. What is the strategy? Some say they're going to flood the country with illegal migrants and just change the whole culture and society, and they're all future voters. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I'm beginning to wonder if... I mean, this may sound crazy, but I'm beginning to wonder if that the people that are the president, and we'll, let's tell the truth here, Joe Biden isn't the president. His handlers are making the policy and making the rules. They don't want the whole, the whole thing to burn down. I mean, the constitutional republic just to burn down and they can start over and, and form it in there what they want to form it into. 
It's it's crazy. I used to think they were looking for voters as well. But let's tell the truth here. They're not going to vote. The only other thing I can think of is they're corporatists. And that used to be the claim that the Democrats made for Republicans for decades. They're the party of big business, and they don't care about the little man. Do you think for a minute that flooding the country with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of illegal migrants isn't going to bring down the hourly wages of the lower half of the wage earners in this country? It is. And that's the part I'll never understand, that minorities flock to the Democrat Party. They're getting screwed over. I mean, it's corporations are making billions and billions more. The Democrats now are the party of the big corporations, and it's a hell of a switch. You know, they talk about the lie of the switch in the, in the South concerning uh, the old Jim Crow Democrats, and oh, they all switched to Republican, which is a lie, of course. Basically, what happened is all the Democrats in the South during the Jim Crow era got voted out of office, and they were replaced by Republicans because people's hearts and minds finally changed, and for the better, I might add. But the switch is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Now, I'm not going to lie. Both sides are war hawks. There's old neocons and there's old neo-dems. War, war, war makes a crap load of money for a lot of their companies that give money to their campaigns. Let's tell the truth. They're more than happy to let someone else's son or daughter go to war, but not theirs. And they line their campaign coffers and their own personal pockets. I mean, we can go into detail, maybe some other episode, and how the Biden family has enriched themselves. It's finding it amazing that uh, of all the presidents, at least in my lifetime, and I'll be 65 this November, whether you hate Donald Trump or love Donald Trump, the fact of the matter is he's the only president, to my knowledge, that was worth significantly less when he left office than when he went in. And there's nobody that can, and if they say differently, they're delusional. But I digress a little bit. I can't figure out the strategy. Letting millions of people in? No borders? No, I mean, just a drain on the resources alone would be unbelievable. I don't get it. I don't get it. I just, I don't see their end game. And you'll say, well, John, they're just crazy progressives now and they're wackier and hacking, blah, 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 and... You know, you know they've, they were in charge now. They are in the White House. They have a majority in the, in the House of Representatives and an ipso facto majority in the Senate with a tie break from the vice president. They may be crazier than heck, but a lot of them aren't stupid. It wouldn't be in these positions of power if they were. They may be opportunists. They may be big mouths. They may be muckrakers. And they may try to make the country much more evil than it really is and cause turmoil and chaos and tear down institutions that have been up for, for decades and centuries, but they're not stupid. So you have to ask yourself, what's the end game? I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss. You know, power and control, I get it. All political organizations want to be in control. I was on city council for eight years. The first four years, I was in the minority. It sucked. Second four years, I was in the majority. Got some more stuff done, but it's a different kind of responsibility. You can't sit there and point fingers anymore. See, when you're in the minority, you can point fingers at the majority and say, bad, 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 you guys really suck, and you don't have to come up with anything. But I just, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Besides the printing of money, fiat currency, for lack of a better term, now we're not in the gold standard anymore. And those of you that wondered why we're not in the gold standard anymore, in my particular opinion, we went off the gold standard with President Nixon because he couldn't pay for all the great society programs that were put in just the administration prior, i.e. Medicaid, food stamps, Medicare, 
the whole list. I'm not saying those programs are needed or not needed, either one. They just cost a lot of money. So President Nixon had to get off the gold standard, which means we just print money. That's dangerous. But anyway, what else have the Democrats done constructive? I mean, you can even say the stimulus money is constructive. I, I think some of it was. I think the bulk of it wasn't. It went to a lot of nonprofits, hundreds of billions of dollars, billions. Give you an idea how much one lousy billion is, and that's a lot. If you get a dollar a second from the second you're born until your 30th birthday, I don't mean a dollar a minute, a dollar an hour, a dollar a second, 24-7, nonstop, for 30 years, you haven't reached a billion yet. That's how much a billion is. And those of you who hear these numbers like a trillion, one trillion dollars is a billion dollars a thousand times. So that means one trillion dollars is one thousand dollars a second for 30 years. Okay? But when you put it all in one year, that means $30,000 a second for an entire year, 24-7. That's real money. And where the hell is it going? Supply chain is disrupted, and I don't want to hear about COVID. If you're a person that's making 12, 15 bucks an hour, and you're getting pretty close to that, we'll say you make $80 less a week by sitting home, why wouldn't you? They say, well, John, you could make 80 more dollars a week working. Who the hell would it work for $2 an hour? And that's all you're really getting. Now, when the tax bill comes to all these people for this money, we're going to have to see. But they want them to stay home. It's like they want the economy to self-destruct. Like I said, I digress a little bit, but Democrat strategy is just, I don't get it. We'll have to see. Maybe they have some secret plan. <laughs> I don't think they do. I think they're making it up as they go along, and they're guessing wrong every time. They're going to get destroyed in the midterms. My guess, I'll make an estimate now. Right now, I believe it's nine seats difference between the Democrats and Republicans, the Dems, and the majority. My understanding, three of those seats are vacant. There's going to be a 40-seat swing. Some call for 30, 35. Some are saying over 50. My guess is, I'll, I'll pick a, an odd number. That way, if I get it exactly right, I look like a genius. I'll say 42. 42 seats are going to flip to Republican control. Now, let's get to the other side of the aisle, the Republicans. Spineless. As, as the, in Spanish guys say, they have no wearables. They have no wearables. It's amazing to me. And that's, and I'm a huge Trump fan, still am. Whether you like that or not, too bad. In the first two years, they had the Senate, the House, and the White House. A lot of things could have got done. Social media censorship could have got fixed. A lot of things could have got done. But the old, old neocons, Ryan is speaker, and a lot in the Senate, and a lot in the House, were anti-Trump people because he was an outsider. Now, in all fairness, so was Barack Obama. He was also an outsider. The old school Dems like Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and all of them had, did not like Barack Obama at all, including Joe Biden. But he got in, just like Trump did. Now, they didn't go after him. But what do the Republicans do to fight back? And I don't mean fight back just for power and control. I mean fight back to save this constitutional republic, to uphold the ideals of the Constitution as written. 
That's always been their mantra from longer than I've been alive. But where is it? They're in charge. It's hard to be in charge. You can't just criticize anymore and point fingers. And basically, Mitch McConnell, uh, the Republicans' uh, only weapon is, whoa, okay, guys, just slow down now. You Democrats, just stop. Just slow down. That's it. No, absolutely not. This is an opportunity for them. Why? Because the Democrats are shooting themselves in the foot and continuously hitting themselves over the head with a hammer. And it, Republicans are watching. Now they might win, but they might not they might win not because they have a lot better ideas or they convince the American people to vote for them. The Democrats are so bad. They might win by default, and that's it's still winning, but it's not the same. It's not a mandate from the people like Ronald Reagan had. You can hate him or love him. He had a mandate, no question, first and second time he ran. Yeah, he was an outsider too, and a lot of Republicans didn't like him. And the one thing I do criticize Ronald Reagan for, one of the major things that he did was the amnesty deal. He cut a deal with Tip O'Neill. And that's the only thing that I think I have a major disagreement with them on. But I digress again. What are Republicans doing? Are they really going to go after them? Well, they say, well, you know, John, conservative people, uh, libertarians, Republicans, we're, we're calmer. We're not as, as crazy as the progressives and the leftists. And we don't scream and holler and confront people and, we don't hit people and we don't attack people as they're protesting or they're having a march or they're trying to have a demonstration on a subject, i.e. the first, second amendments. The progressives will attack them. But we're above that kind of thing because we use reason. We use common sense. And we've always been like that. We're not going to lower ourselves to their level. You know what? Forget it. Forget it. You're bringing a knife to a gunfight and you continually do it. It might be distasteful and maybe uncomfortable and maybe against your nature. Uh, I'm not sure I forget what play it's from. William Shakespeare. Um, I'm paraphrasing. I'm doing this from memory, but nothing beholds a man as much as humility. When the winds of war blow, assume the eye of the tiger. Take fair nature and make it into terrible rage. It's something similar to that. In other words, you're at war. Use the tactics of the Democrats. Now, I'm not calling for violence. But one thing is going to dovetail pretty good in my last subject here, and that's sticking together. One thing I'll give the Dems. No matter how bat blank crazy they are, they always stick together publicly. Very, very rarely do you hear something incredibly stupid that AOC says of the so called squad members. Very rarely will you hear the Speaker of the House, in this case, Nancy Pelosi, or any other high ranking Dems, or any Dems for that matter, speak out against them. Now, God knows what they say privately. Republicans, they're more open-minded and honest. And this is where honesty and integrity now works against you. I know it sounds terrible. Republicans have to stick together. Don't go after the Marjorie Taylor Greens. Don't go after any of those. And Congress member uh, Boebert from Colorado, I like them both a lot. Especially Boebert. Boy, I'll tell you, she's... She's got what it takes. She's got a set. Republicans can learn from that. If you have disagreements from any of those people or any of the people that are raising hell in the Republican Party, take it up with them privately. Show some spunk. Show some backbone. Grow some wearables. Learn from your enemy. That's one of the most important things in politics, war, and even in personal life. Learn from your mistakes and learn the things your enemies are doing 
that are successful and copy them the best you can. It's a year and a half until the midterms. I have no clue what's going to be left of this country. I have no clue what condition it's going to be in. I have no clue if Donald Trump is going to run again. I have no clue if Ron DeSantis from Florida is going to run. I don't know any of that. But are the Republicans going to squander a golden opportunity in the Senate? My guess in the Senate, I said, what, 42 flip seats in the House? I'm going to say, I'm going to be a little, um, I'm going to be a little positive on the Senate. I think right now, currently it's 50-50. I think that the Republicans are going to end up picking up four seats. I say 54-46. Now that's ways away from 60 votes, but I don't know if any, everybody out there knows this, but the Senate is not up for re-election every two years. Just a third of it is. And another brilliant thing from the founders, they didn't want too much change too quickly. So that's why the House is every two years and two-year term. So that's a six-year term, and only a third of it is up every two years. So there's not too much change too quickly. Brilliant. But I digress again. I think it's going to be 54-46, pick up 42 seats in the House. But unfortunately the progressives will still control the White House. Now, it'll be the same people, whether Joe Biden resigns, retires, whatever term you want to use, and Kamala Harris is sworn in. It'll be fun to see, though, the Democrats put up as the vice president after that because they have to have congressional approval. That'll be fun to watch. My guess is Joe Biden will be gone in the beginning of next year. Eh, right around when uh, normally you're sworn in, January 20th. We'll say the first 10, 12 days in January, they're going to give some cockamamie reason, and Joe Biden's going to step down for health reasons. Kamala Harris will be sworn in as president, and then they'll pick a vice president with congressional approval. That'll be fun to watch. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know the American people, the vast majority of the people that just try to get the information they can and watch the news and make their best decision. I'm not talking about the whack job progressives and leftists that are so dug in, no matter what craziness their leaders try to do, they'll always go along with it, even when it's nuts. I'm talking about the normal people, the 15, 20% in the middle, they have to make up their mind. And I know there's a lot of Democrats out there that simply can't vote for Republican. Okay, all right, I get it to a certain extent. You hate Donald Trump, you hate Republicans, but think about the facts. The Democrats are tearing down this republic. When you go in to vote, you can't vote for a Republican, you can't bring yourself to do it. Don't vote for either. If there's a third-party candidate, vote for them. Or write in your own name. In fact, I would love to see a national campaign done that when you can write in, anybody can write in a vote in any municipality. I'm in upstate New York, Arkansas, California, you name it. Write-ins are allowed by law on all offices. I would love to see a national campaign done and the person you would vote for, you write in none of the above. Those you Democrats out there that can't vote for Republicans, do that. That way your vote isn't wasted. At least it's showing the Democrats you're going in the wrong direction. I can't turn against my own people, but I need to send a message to the party that I know and love, in this case Democrats, you're going, you're doing the wrong thing. I think that would be great. So we're going to see what happens. Those are just some of my thoughts. Uh, What are your thoughts on this first Curtis Goes Corner podcast? I think it's going to be fascinating. But one thing I will say, and history bears me out, since the inception of this country, no matter how much trouble we've been in financially, socially, constitutionally, 
and every single world leader, anybody that's in Europe, Asia, Africa, South America, you name it, anywhere in the world who knows anything about American history, even Vladimir Putin will say, one thing about the Americans, they are incredibly resilient. We are the most resilient nation in the world and always have been. Until the next time, goodbye and good luck.